Concerning Him, an Emmaus podcast is a ministry of Emmaus Bible College. Concerning Him seeks to enrich Christians around the globe by educating and equipping them through various media. For more information about Emmaus, please visit emmaus.edu. Hello and welcome to Concerning Him, an Emmaus podcast. I'm your host, Eric Rasmussen, and joining us today is J.J. Routley. Hello, Eric. Thanks for being on today. Uh, J.J. is a professor of biblical studies here at Emmaus and the director of the archaeology program. Uh, We're going today to talk about J.J.'s recent article for the Gospel Coalition, uh, where he sees uh, Joshua as a type of Christ. Uh, But before we get there... I'd like to talk a little bit about JJ and and who you are and, and what you've done and what you're doing now. So if you could tell us just a little bit about your journey to where you got to where you are now in life. Yeah, sure. Well, it all started back in 1981 when I was born. Uh, I'm just kidding. John we, and Mary we, Rowley. We won't, go, we won't go that far back. Um, I began uh, working for Emmaus in 2012. I did some adjunct teaching for the Educational Ministries Department. Uh, My first course was uh, actually administration and leadership in youth ministry, and I had been involved in youth ministry for a number of years before that. Uh, In 2013, I came to work for Emmaus full-time and worked in the Student Life Department Um, I oversaw the chapel program, oversaw SLT servant leader uh, training, um, our service learning program for several years. And then in 2016, uh, I had been teaching a few more admin classes and teaching general studies a little bit during that time. In 2016, I was given opportunity to transition into teaching half-time archaeology courses and uh, just really loved that. And the other half was uh, alumni work and um, uh, Emmaus Ministries, so conferences and things like that, much of what you are doing (laughs) uh, now. Um, So enjoyed working with alumni for about four years until 2020 when I uh, became a full-time faculty member, and uh, that's what I've been doing since then, teaching archaeology, Bible, theology courses. Okay. And could you tell us a little bit about your education journey up until this point? Sure. I attended Emmaus in 99-2000, just did the one-year program, and then transferred to Wheaton College uh, because I was looking to do some work in archaeology and Near Eastern studies. So I ended up graduating from Wheaton um, with a Bachelor of Arts in in Ancient Near Eastern Studies. And then uh, because of massive amounts of student loans. I returned to (laughs) Dubuque and for the next 10 years I uh, worked with my father and brother doing construction work. And during that time I I worked as a volunteer leader for the youth group at our uh, local chapel. I did some itinerant preaching at different camps and conferences. And the more that I spoke, the, the harder questions would come back in and I would be thinking, you know, I I should really do some additional training in some of these areas. And so I did the uh, equivalent of a one-year Master of Arts program in theological studies through Faith uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, one of our, at the undergrad levels, one of our competitors. Oh, yes. (laughs) One of our sports rivals as well. (laughs) uh, And uh, so graduated from there in 2012 and then I did a really weird and bizarre uh, (laughs) graduate study system, and I don't recommend doing this, but I sort of jumped around from for a couple of schools. I went to uh, Columbia International University and did uh, a year's worth of study online there, actually took Greek online that way, and and at the same time sat in on uh, Mark Stevenson's class uh, at Emmaus, which was very, very helpful. And then after that year, I had enough credits at the graduate level that I could transfer to a a Master of Theology program. So I ended up going to a Western Seminary that's out in Portland, Oregon, um, and did a THM degree uh, that way, kind of a hybrid system. I'd go out there for a week at a time and study and do work beforehand and afterward to turn it in. And so uh, ended up graduating with the THM in uh, 2000. Uh, 18, 
And then I had not had enough pain and suffering, so I went back to, <laughs> to studying, went, went for a, a PhD in 2019, and I'm in my third year of that program uh, in the dissertation stage, hoping to finish up, Lord willing, please, Lord, please, next, by next summer. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> so a year from now, we'll be calling you Dr. JJ. Well, if everything goes <laughs> rightly, but the Lord knows. All right. Well, today, like I said, we're going to be talking about uh, Joshua as a type of Christ. I know that you're you're working on a paper on a similar topic with Joshua uh, for ETS. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, it's it's actually kind of a subset of this. Um, it all started about a year ago. I was teaching a course here on the book of Joshua and just noticed the number of times that it would say. <laughs> Uh, the word of the Lord uh, was spoken to Joshua, or Joshua spoke the word of the Lord to the people. And, and these phrases, um, and, and these are actually technical, particular Hebrew phrases of some of these things, uh, ko amar Adonai, thus says the Lord. These are common in prophetic literature. And it just kind of jumped out at me, like, you know, Joshua is, is filling the role of a prophet, in many ways and what he's doing on behalf of the people. He's speaking to the people from the Lord. So the Lord would talk to him and he would communicate the message to the people. And so I'm trying to develop this because um, I, I did some research into this to see has anybody really you know, pulled this together. Uh, a fair amount has been done with Moses as prophet. Okay. And then later on, when you get into the time of Samuel, but with Joshua, I think there's a lot of material there. And to my knowledge, I don't think it's really been given a lot of attention up to this point. Okay. So I'm excited to look into that a little bit more. And I'm, I've got a paper coming up, I think, in November that I'll be presenting. Okay. Uh, and I should clarify ETS, Evangelical Theological Society. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, as we get started, it, it'd probably be, be good for you to give us a definition of type. We're talking about Joshua as a type of Christ. And what, what do we mean when we use that word type? Sure. You know, some people... Um, are a little bit uncomfortable with this. They want to see maybe this be uh, a rather technical term, have mm -hmm. a pretty narrow usage. Uh, I'm a little more perhaps permissive in the way that I see it and, and use it. But uh, if, if you're going to be very technical and use the Greek term here, I think it's very limited as to uh, the New Testament testimony for who could be called or who could be considered a type, um, Melchizedek being the primary figure uh, from the book of Hebrews. But um, I, I, I think I would be, and, and the way I usually portray this to people is it's sort of a, a picture, an Old Testament picture of what's to come uh, in the person or the life or the work of Christ in his coming. And I really like the definition that's given by uh, Graham Cole in his book called He Who Gives Life. And this is what Cole says. He says, typology is the idea that persons like Moses or events like the Exodus and even institutions like the temple can in the plan of God prefigure a later stage in that plan and provide the uh, conceptuality necessary for understanding the divine intent. So, for example, he says the coming of Christ to be the new Moses who would affect the new Exodus and in his person serves as uh, the new temple, so to speak. Um, so, uh, for me, typology is just a way of saying uh, when we see some of these Old Testament persons or events that take place, or even uh, institutions like the tabernacle. Now, I think you can go to the extreme <laughs> with some of this, and certainly uh, authors have in the past, and see uh, a type of Christ in every element. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily think we need to look at the tent pegs of the tabernacle and see uh, something about Christ in each of these things where it's not clearly portrayed in scripture, but certainly uh, there are symbols um, within the tabernacle um, that are brought up again, particularly in the Gospel of John. You know, Jesus says, the light of the world. 
and uh, thinking about light within the tabernacle and, and what it was used for, what its purpose was for. Jesus as the bread from heaven and uh, the similarities between the showbread, the, the, the loaves of bread that were cooked for the 12 tribes and set before the Lord in the presence of the Lord. Um, I think there are some similarities in those okay. things. I don't want to draw a one-to-one -one correlation. This is where I think people get crazy. <laughs> Just because there's a facet of something that pictures or gives us a hint about the life and work of Christ doesn't mean that everything about that is exactly like Christ. Okay. So uh, even within what I would say about Joshua from the book of Joshua, um, it's not as if he portrays Christ in every last detail, because we know there are a number of times where he fails in his leadership. Mm -hmm. Certainly, he's not imaging the Lord in, in his failure. Um, but there are, I think, these shadows, these prefigurings of some of the things that he, that he does well. Yeah. And, and could you explain to us some of those, those examples, maybe, that you see in, in, in Joshua in his life and how he typifies Christ. Yeah, I'll go through just a couple that uh, kind of stand out to me. One of them we've already talked a little bit about is Joshua as a prophet. Mm -hmm. And I think this isn't discussed about the Savior enough as well either, but Jesus in his public ministry not only served to reveal the Father, he, he held a prophetic office. Um, and some work has been done on this in the past five or ten years in, in modern academia to kind of uh, demonstrate the way that Jesus functioned as a prophet. He really was uh, speaking prophetically to the people of Israel throughout his uh, public ministry uh, on behalf of the Lord. So I think Joshua in his prophetic office, really all of the Old Testament prophets, uh, are prefiguring the ultimate prophet who was to come. And that's coming right out of the book of Deuteronomy where uh, the Lord says uh, through Moses uh, that he would rake, raise up a, a, a prophet like him mm. who would be greater than him. And ultimately, I think that's fulfilled in the life of, of the Lord Jesus. Uh, one of the ways that um, Joshua can be seen to be a picture of Christ, a prefiguring of Christ, would be through his leadership. He is told in the first chapter to be strong and courageous. Uh, this is a very common chapter for many of us who mm -hmm. are followers of the Lord. Um, we have this these verses on pictures and picture frames. I, my son actually has one in his room. So uh, pretty uh, f famous um, uh, verses for us. Um, but how is he to be strong and courageous? Is he to channel his inner American ninja warrior and just, you know, hulk up and, and do some weightlifting and, and figure it out? No, God goes on to tell him in Joshua chapter 1, this is how you are to be strong and courageous. You adhere to the law that I gave through Moses. So if we were to put that in contemporary language, in order for Joshua to be strong and courageous, he needed to know the word of the Lord and put it into practice in his life. And he's told you should meditate on it day and day and, day and night. And uh, this meditation, we shouldn't be afraid of talking about. This is not Eastern <laughs> mythicism, you know. Um, it, it is biblical meditation, which is... Uh, in the Hebrew, actually a murmuring or recitation okay. of the law of the Lord. So the law that Moses gave, Joshua was to think about it through actually speaking it, memorizing it, committing it to his mind and to his heart. Um, and in that sense, he is to seek to follow what the Lord has directed him in every area of his life. Now, we know he, he does a pretty good job, at least as presented in the book. I'm sure there was a lot of failure that's mm -hmm. not presented in the book. Jesus perfectly follows yeah. the law of the Lord and adheres to that fully. So what Joshua sought to do and yet could not do fully because of sin in his heart and his life the Lord Jesus perfectly fulfills. Um, he is a uh, deliverer. Joshua is a deliverer. Now, now we don't think about this 
often when we think about the book of Joshua, we think about the conquest, and it is popular today to talk about the conquest of Canaan as genocide and, and all kinds of different um, uh, connotations. Um, that would be an interesting topic to discuss <laughs> at some point as well. Um, we don't often think about Joshua's role as deliverer, but there are people uh, within the conquest that are um, pulled away from the Lord's wrath and judgment on Canaan. Rahab is one of these key individuals. Uh, Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 6. In Joshua 2, when she welcomes the spies in, she tells them, the reason that I'm helping you is because we heard about what your God did in Egypt, and we heard about what he did in the Transjordan to uh, Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites over there. And she says, essentially, I don't want to die, and I believe that your God is bringing judgment on the land, and uh, that's why I'm helping you in the hope that uh, I will be able to be preserved and my family, my household with me. And then, of course, in chapter 6, during the conquest of Jericho, when they come in, all of the wall falls except for the portion where Rahab's house mm -hmm. remains. And so she is delivered from the judgment, the wrath of God that descends upon that city. Uh, you also have the Gibeonites later on who come to Joshua. Now their, their methods, their means, and even Rahab's are not the most upright, right? The Gibeonites seek to deceive the Israelites and trick them into welcoming them in. Um, but uh, through all of that, despite their methods, their, the reason why they did what they were doing was the same as Rahab. They, they knew that they were next on the, the hit list of Israel's God, and they didn't want to perish. And so they had faith that Yahweh was going to do what he said he was going to do, and in an attempt to uh, work their way through that and be delivered, they come to Israel and uh, deceive them into creating a covenant with them. And so Joshua now, he, after that covenant is made, he could have said all of Israel wanted them to break the covenant at that point and just wipe out the Gibeonites. But he is faithful to his word at that point. And uh, in the next chapter, the kings of the southern arena all come up and attack Gibeon. And again, Joshua is faced with the, the question, well, what should I do? Should I help these guys? And he's faithful to the covenant that they made to them. And because of that, the Lord uses that to allow them to very rapidly take all of the southern arena in the land of Canaan. So those are just a couple of ways. Uh, you know, Joshua delivers some of the people uh, of the land of Canaan who turn to the God of Israel in faith. And I think there's a beautiful picture of salvation in Christ there. Uh, Jesus delivers those, saves from sin, saves, saves from hell and eternal damnation, any who turn in faith to him. And so I think we have a beautiful picture. Again, it doesn't correspond in every way, mm -hmm. and I don't think it was intended to, but in the sense that you, you can see uh, deliverance from wrath and judgment uh, in the life of Joshua for those who turn and place their faith in the God of Israel, the, case, the same can be said of, of faith in Christ today. Well, thank you. That was, that was great. Um, as we're thinking about this and as we're talking about this, I want to talk about, and, and you mentioned it briefly before as we were, we were getting into this, I want to talk about some of the hermeneutics mm -hmm. behind this, the, the process of, of studying scripture. And as you mentioned, um, it's possible to have a very narrow or maybe specific mm -hmm. view of typology. Um, and with that, thinking about that, is it dangerous to view Joshua as a type of Christ? And, and, and we could, we could, widen this out to um, other Old Testament figures, people, um, events, and, and viewing them as types, is it is it dangerous when Scripture doesn't specifically tell us that they are? Yeah, I think it can be, absolutely, especially where you want to go in some of your um, applications and implications. Um, so if you want to 
look at David's battle in Goliath, uh, with Goliath and say, you know, this is a picture of Christ's battle against the demonic forces in the heavenly places. You know, something like that, I think there's a little less uh, precedence for, for doing some of these things. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. So take someone like Joseph, okay. for example, uh, the life of Joseph. And if I were to ask you, you know, do you think, I'm not putting you on the spot, <laughs> by the way, do you think Joseph is a picture of Christ in any way? I think most, most of us as followers of Jesus would say, well, yeah, I mean, he suffered early in his life, greatly in his life. And then he came into, God brought him through that and gave him authority over essentially the entire land of, of Egypt. Uh, so there's a lot of commonalities in the storyline of Joshua, or, or I'm sorry, Joseph, yeah. and uh, the, the life of Jesus. Now, we don't have any New Testament precedent for saying there's a correspondence there. And yet, I think within the character of the individual, because Joseph continues to rely on the Lord mm -hmm. throughout those experiences, so within the character, you can see similarities in the character. Uh, you can see similarities in what they went through. The same can be said of the life of David in many of the Psalms. Now, I do think there's a difference in the Psalms because I think David is not simply writing his feelings and his emotions, uh, but as it is inspired by the Lord and prophetically. Yeah. The New Testament makes very clear that David wrote about himself prophetically beyond himself. Mm -hmm. There's more to it than just that. So I, I think you do have prophecy as a necessary um, piece of the puzzle okay. in some of these instances. Um, but in a situation like Joseph, I think part of why we can see these, these pictures and similarities is because really uh, the Lord Jesus is the perfect and righteous individual. He's the perfect man. He's the second and last Adam, the only one who's fully fulfilled the law of the Lord. And so any other person uh, whose life demonstrates some elements of holiness and righteousness are going to picture that in some way, shape, or form. And I do think in the wisdom of God, God allowed that for people, particularly in Old Testament times, but for us as well, to be able to see some of these similarities and say, you know, that reminds me hmm. uh, of Jesus and what Jesus would do. Now, uh, again, you, you do have, and especially in the early church, you know, the early church after the time of the apostles is an interesting period. They really wanted to see uh, pictures of Jesus in the life of Joshua. And I think sometimes they went to the extreme with some of them. Okay. Um, one in particular was seeing in the name Joshua and the change from uh, the biblical Hosea to Joshua, which is the Hebrew equivalent of what becomes the Greek Yeshua, Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, so they will see, you know, this is the, the Hebrew Jesus. And because of that, just based on the name similarity <laughs> alone, want to draw a lot of connections there. So they're, a lot of times they're looking at why did Moses change his name? And they will say things like, well, Moses was a prophet and he was seeing that this, was a, this person was a picture of the Son of God who was to come. Now, some of that's interesting, but I think that really goes beyond the, the um, categories, the boundaries that Scripture really presents for us into the world of speculation a little <laughs> bit. So what I want to do more of is say, okay, what do we know about Jesus from, from the New Testament that is true, that is sound, and how can we see elements of his character, his life, his, the salvation that he brings in these Old Testament figures, events, things like that. 
So I do think there are hermeneutical parameters, and the biggest one would be uh, not really seeking to extend beyond, not, not narrowly what the New Testament would say, okay. specifically about who or what event, but a little more broadly, the, the picture in the New Testament, the template of what is being said mm -hmm. about Christ, his character, his person, his work. Um, so yeah, if you read through some of the early church individuals, I've got Justin Martyr here, uh, a couple that he presents are kind of fun. Uh, he says there are at least five parallels between Jesus and Joshua. Number one, just as other Old Testament names, Abraham and Sarah find significance, so too does the renaming of Hosea to Joshua. Uh, number two, just as Joshua led the people of God, so too does Jesus. And I think, I mean, that was one of my points <laughs> there. I think that one is uh, valid. Just as Joshua distributed the inheritance, so too does Jesus. And I think that finds its basis in Hebrews chapter 4. Okay. Uh, with the giving of rest, there remains a uh, new creation rest. I think is how the author of Hebrews presents it for those who believe in Jesus. And so we should seek to make sure we don't fall away and that we can enter into that rest. Because the point there is the generation in Moses' day saw the signs and wonders in Egypt. They heard the word of the Lord, and yet so many of them did not believe. And in their unbelief, they fell away. Uh, how many today will hear the good news of the gospel, initially seem to receive it, but in their hearts there's really not that transformation. There's mm -hmm. not that saving faith. And so over time they fall away and uh, do not enter into the, the heavenly rest that is to come. So I think that one's valid also. This one's a little interesting. Just as Joshua told the sun to stand still in the sky, and it did, so too Jesus is the light of God who will provide light eternal for his people. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a little more, to me, a little more extended. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> and I might that. feel yeah. comfortable expressing. <laughs> um, just as Joshua, this one I think is the farthest stretch. Okay. <laughs> Just as Joshua circumcised the Jews a second time uh, from Joshua 5 2, so too Jesus will circumcise his people with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Oh my. <laughs> Again, I'm not, I'm not advocating <laughs> for that one, but I think it's interesting to think through why, they're, why the early church fathers are doing yeah. some of this. And uh, I think they, um, they have some good points, and yet they extend beyond um, some of the biblical boundaries, I think, that are in place there um, for, those, for those things. So. <clears throat> I know it's a it's a tricky yeah. topic and and uh, yeah. one that I continue to think through for sure. Well, and and as we wrap up here, at working through all of this, I, one of the things I want to know is is what does it change if you were to let's say preach through the book of Joshua, um, if you were teaching through it, what is your understanding of of Joshua as a type of Christ or mm -hmm. Joshua as a picture of Christ? What is that changing about? how you would teach or preach. Yeah, I think a couple of things I would say on that uh, point. Uh, so Charles Spurgeon is very famously um, quoted as, as saying, when I have a text, when I preach a text, I take the text and I make a beeline for yeah. the cross. And I think that's something <clears throat> that we can, we can seek to do in our presentation of Old Testament historical texts. Uh, sometimes in our preaching, the Old Testament comes across as so dry because there isn't a connection between these ancient times and what's done, what's happened through the coming of Christ. When I would preach through or teach through the book of Joshua, I would seek to ask the question, how can we see Jesus in this passage or in this section, in, either in his character or in his, the salvation that he brings? 
Uh, is there something in this passage that points me toward Christ? And I think that's helpful to kind of consider, not just for the book of Joshua, but mm-hmm. for the Old Testament as a whole uh, as well. And um, uh, the other thing that I would say is that I think uh, it gives us the understanding that uh, really Scripture is, sometimes we divide and too strongly and wrongfully the Old Testament from the New Testament. But Scripture is one story, one united story. And the focal point of that story is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, uh, made flesh. And I think you can see that even in these earliest books, the Pentateuch, the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, <laughs> even the book of Judges. And and I think the, the point is... Uh, to get us to think about our own sin and how this can be rectified, what God is doing uh, to try to uh, take care of some of this. So in those senses, I think it's imperative that when we preach Old Testament texts, we don't simply preach them for their uh, historicity, their original Mm -hmm. setting, although I think those things are very important, Um, but we preach them uh, to ultimately reveal um, how God is uh, showing us his plan, his purposes, and ultimately that's through the sending of his son. Wow. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. We, uh, we hope to have you on soon and have some more conversations like this. It All was right. really enjoyable. And uh, yeah, we will see you next time on Concerning Him. Thank you for listening to Concerning Him, an Emmaus podcast. Ministries like Concerning Him are possible because of the generous contributions from our partners around the world. For more information about partnering with us, please visit emmaus.edu slash partner.